God bless you and good Wednesday afternoon. I do thank God for this privilege and opportunity to come to share with you the word of God for our Wednesday midweek Bible class. God has been blessing us and God has been truly uh, lifting and enlightening us and showing himself strong to us throughout this month. And my prayer is for each of you that you are coming to know uh, revival and restoration and relief from the things that have oppressed us, especially these last uh, 11 months. But in the meantime, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your participation in this ministry. Thank you for your faithfulness and your tithes and your offerings. Thank you to all of our members, to our friends, to our supporters. There are so many of you that are doing what you're doing for this ministry that we may not get to meet physically uh, because of the geography. And I thank God that we're being watched and, 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 and are being uh, viewed coast to coast. And I thank you for that. Please continue to share these lessons and continue to encourage one another with the word of God. Let's get right into the word, if you will. Uh, I began with you uh, back last month, actually, on the 27th of January with our theme for this series of lessons. When we show up for God, he will show up for us. And that comes from James, the fourth chapter. And for time's sake, I'll just use that eighth verse, the first part of that eighth verse. Come near to God and he will come near to you. In the King James, it says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh or near to you. And it's so important, this being the year of God's manifestation in which we're looking to God to show up and to show out, to show himself strong, to help us, to bless us, to heal us, to deliver us from all the things that have been afflicting us, especially these last 11 months. But throughout our lives, we're not just looking for instant relief from the pandemic. Yes, we need that. But we're also looking, God, release the chains, release your people from bondage. And these are bondages, Some, uh, and for those of us old enough, it goes all the way back to the 20th century. And for the young people, it goes back as far as when you were born in this century. But it's important that we seek God and that we get close to God, because if we really want, are serious, we're really serious about deliverance. And I thank and praise God for my dear friend and bishop, Bishop W.J. Cham Chambers, who is celebrating his 92nd birthday this month. Uh, but I learned this from him, how if we are really serious about deliverance and really seeking to know God and to be close to God and to get God's best, we have to go after God like never before. We can't just sit back and say, well, here I am, Lord, you got to go come and find me and, and please me. No, we have to seek him, find him, please him. And he's not hard to find because the Bible says in that passage I just read, when you draw close to him, he will draw close to you. I laid the foundation of, a couple weeks ago and last week I shared with you about drawing close to God in faith but I want to share two additional things today. Next week, we'll wrap it up. But I want to share two additional things, if you will, today. Uh, drawing close to God through repentance. It is so important that we come to God. And that passage, and I, I actually should have read it, it goes on, uh, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your minds, you double-minded. The key thing here is that when we come to God, we have to get rid of the baggage. I, I shared that in, in some of the lessons last year and over the years. We have to get rid of all of our weights, all of the sins that so easily beset us. That's Hebrews uh, 13th chapter, I'm sorry, 12th chapter in the first verse. We have to come to God and seek to be clean because understand one of the mindsets, and I say it like this just to set up the lesson today. Uh, back in the day, and I, and I remember when going to the country uh, where my parents grew up, they were from Alabama and Virginia respectively, and they lived out in the country. I mean, beautiful land. It, it was simply a wonderful place to be as a child and even as an adult. And when we would get ready for church, everyone would dress up 
And the purpose for that was we wanted to present our best. I couldn't go to church, even though if they only had service, maybe first and third Sunday, kind of like we're doing now because of the pandemic. But back then, they, the preacher had more than one church, and they would stagger his, 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 his preaching Sundays. So preaching Sunday would be maybe first and third Sunday at this church and second and fourth Sunday at that church. And maybe one church would meet at 10 o'clock and then the other church would meet at 1130, however way they were working. But just because they didn't have church every Sunday and they had Sunday school every Sunday, uh, didn't mean that we could just go in our short pants, this is what we wore as kids, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, go in our short pants with dusty knees from the sand or the red dirt that we were playing in and, and you know, just get up out of bed, roll and just go. No, you always gave God your best. You always came to God dressed up. That was on the outside. That was the understanding of that era and it made good sense. Well, we understand even better today. It doesn't mean we're superior to what our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents did. It simply means God has given us an even deeper understanding. And so now the emphasis is not so much on what you were on the outside, but the emphasis is and is exactly where it should be on what we do with the inside. Uh, it's so important. As Jesus shared, and I believe that was in Matthew, uh, he talked about how the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, he said, you make the outside of the plate clean, but on the inside is full of, of filth. You know, you're like white as sepulchers. You know, on the outside, the tombs were painted and they were, they were attractive physically, but on the inside, they were full of rotten corruption. Well, God wants us to come to him and deal with what's on the inside. He said, Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup first, clean the inside of the plate, clean the inside of the vessel, and then the outside will be acceptable. And, and that's one of the reasons why even today, the emphasis, as I said, is not so much on being dressed up, but it's on being clean on the inside, being right with God on the inside. That emphasis can never change. Amen. Because God loves us. He loves all of us, regardless of our faults, our shortcomings, and our sins. John third chapter and the 17th verse. After telling us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed on him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. Jesus then says, he didn't come to this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans 5 and 8, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners, before we even knew God. And Ephesians 2 uh, second chapter, the fourth and fifth verses. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave his life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that we have been saved. And so he will allow nothing to separate us from his love. And so I would tell each and every one of us, those who are new Christians, those who are baby Christians, those of us who have been Christians, uh, for however long it's been, whether it's been a year, 50 years, 80 years, however long it's been, that we must make sure that those things that are on the inside, that we repent, that even every day we can say, Lord, if I did anything, and we know we did, if I did anything that's unpleasing to you, that displeases you, forgive me. Forgive the sins that I confess to you today. Forgive those secret sins I didn't even know I did. Amen. Because there's nothing that God will allow to come between us and him. But we have to make sure we don't allow our flesh, our pride, our ego, our religious mindsets. We can't allow any of that. Because if we're going to draw nigh to God, if we're going to draw near to God, we have to come to him in repentance. We have to come to him saying, Lord, I need you to forgive me. I need you to help me. Repentance is not about saying, ooh, I said a bad word, I'm sorry. And then tomorrow, you get up and say the same bad word over and over. I'm just using that as an example. Forgiveness is not, and I use this also, you step on someone's foot at church and it's, oh, baby, I'm so sorry. Can you please forgive me? And then the following Sunday, you look for them and step on their foot again because you, you didn't like them in the first place. That's not repentance. Repentance is about doing a 180. It's about turning and going in the opposite direction. 
seeking God's help. And only God can help us to do these things. Seeking God's help and the power of his Holy Spirit to turn around, turn away from. If you were headed south, repentance means you're going to turn around and head north. Polar opposite of where we were headed in sin. Because there's nothing that will separate us from the love of God. Romans 8th chapter, 38th and 39th verses, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow. Not, and this is a New Living Translation. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky or above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God, which is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. And because of his love, because of his love, God did so love, he did love us so much. He so loved the whole world, everyone in the world, everyone who would ever be born. He loved all of us that he gave his only begotten son that no one had to go to hell. No one has to live separate or separated from God. Understand, that sin means a person has chosen to live a life separate from God in life. And if you choose to live separated from God in life, then you will be separated eternally from him after death. And that means hell. That means fire and brimstone. That means eternal hopelessness and suffering. That means things that are so horrible that God himself said, let me try to save as many as who will accept me and go down to Calvary and die and, ri and rise from the dead again. That's how horrible hell is. So make sure we draw near to God, not out of fear. That's the other thing. God doesn't want us living, living and trusting him because we're scared of going to hell. Hell should be a great motivating factor for anyone not to want to go there. But we should also draw close to God, not out of fear of hell, but out of love for him. We love him because he first loved us. And then understand that God is merciful. I, I was going to save this uh, for later, but I'm going to share this with you now. In 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when it seems like, God, you're not doing anything, you're letting this stuff roll, God is exercising his mercy. And in the midst of his mercy, whether we see it or not, souls are still being saved. Amen. So draw near to God through repentance. Lord, I want a change in my life. I want things better. I want things different. I want to live pleasing to you at all times. Amen. Let me share with you the third point out of, out of the ones that I have to share with you out of this lesson. Draw near to God with sincere praise and worship. Now understand, we're not in church. Uh, we're not worshiping in our churches corporately and publicly as we once did. That'll happen. That'll happen in, and, and we're trusting God that it'll be this year. But understand, we can worship God in spirit and in truth right where we are right now. You can worship God in your house. You can worship him if you, wherever you're watching this, in your kitchen, in your bedroom, in your living room, in your family room, in the basement. Uh, it's too cold to be out in the yard right now, but when it warms up in a couple of months, wherever we are, we can praise him in the car. Just make sure you pay attention to where you are and hold on to that wheel. We can play, praise him in public transit, wherever we are. We can worship and praise God. Worshiping, uh, what, praise and worship is a means. It's, it's, it's not a, a trend. For many people, it became a trend. It became something that, you know, this is what, uh, th this is what they're doing now. No, praise and worship is about getting close to God and loving on God. We're worshiping him because of who he is. We're praising him because of what he has done and what he does and what he will do. John, fourth chapter, 24th verse. God is a spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus was talking to the woman at the well and she was not a believer. She was a Samaritan and, 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 and they were going back and forth. She was trying to give him some arguments about, you know, Judaism and all the rest of that. But Jesus 
broke it down and said, God is a spirit. And if you're going to have a relationship, a worship relationship with him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let me deal with that just for a moment. I'm going to finish this portion next week, but let me go as far as I can in the next few minutes. Uh, first of all, he's a spirit. He requires that we worship him in spirit and in truth. That means we're in, in, to worship in spirit means we are concerned and connected with the spiritual realities of who God is, of what God expects of us, of our relationship with God, and of the power and importance and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It means that we are connected to God and not to our church buildings, not to our sanctuaries, not to the color of the, uh, of the carpet on the floor or whatever color the pew cushions are, that we're not caught up in our wardrobe. How many of us that have worked in the church any length of time have been in a meeting where people got into it over what color they were going to wear for annual day or what color they were going to wear for choir robes or what color they were going to wear for usher uniforms or whatever it was. Uh, a preacher friend of mine once told me he had to cut short an engagement and rush back to his church because two of the church mothers got into fight arguing about what they were going to wear for Mother's Day in a few weeks uh, from that point. We cannot live that kind of life and try to bring God that level of worship, that subpar worship. We have to worship him and not be all caught up in how good we look. You know, I, I can't, I, I, I spent so much time, and I, as a pastor, I use this before I cut it off. Uh, 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 I can't be so caught up in my, in my pulpit robes, and I can't wrinkle my robes, and, and I can't, you know, mess up, my, well, I don't have any hair, but I can't mess up uh, 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 and, and look askew because, you know, I can't get into real worship because I don't want to mess up my, my stuff, my wardrobe. Worshiping God in spirit means that it's not about the trappings, the external stuff. For those in Catholicism and other religions like that, the shrines, the artifacts, the outward practices of religion. In Jesus' day, as a matter of fact, it would apply to the feasts, the sacrifices, the religious hierarchy with the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and, and all the other, other folks of that era. How many of us have to avoid or realize that we have to get rid of? And during this time in which we're worshiping apart and praising God separately, we have to get rid of all of those sacred cows. In other words, it's time to have a barbecue. We cannot allow stuff to get in the way of us focusing on who God is. We worship God because we love God. You can worship him in whatever you have on. You can worship him in any kind of uh, situation or scenario. There are those who are incarcerated, and if you are viewing this, you know that you can worship God where you are. There are those in the hospital room. There are those in places where they don't want to be at this point, but you can still worship God there. It is so important. And then to worship him in spirit and then in truth means that we worship him according to the truth of his word according to the whole counsel of his word, recognizing God's holiness, his purity, his perfection, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, none of that can be omitted. We're worshiping him and praising him according to what the Bible reveals to us, both the Old and the New Testament revelation of who God is. That is so important. I'm going to stop at that point. Next week, we're going to pick it up here how to praise God, how to draw close to him in, in worship, in praise, with a spirit of thanksgiving. Amen. But in the meantime, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your many blessings. We thank you for allowing us to study your word, and we thank you for your faithfulness in allowing us to gather 
and be your people, even in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you for keeping us connected, even though there are so many things that are mandated that we remain apart for health and for safety. We pray, Father, for the healing, for the deliverance, for the restoration of your people everywhere. Whatever the situation is, Father, we know that you have the answer for it because you are the answer for each and every situation. Bless and keep us now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Remember, love on folks this week. This is Valentine's Day com this coming Sunday. And of course, we're having uh, our event this coming Friday night. It will be virtual and you've already received the instructions for it. But listen, it's not just about romantic love. Let's make it a practice of sharing the love of Jesus Christ with each and every one that we meet everywhere that we go. And you don't have to walk around and say, I love you. Just simply be nice to them, be kind to them, encourage them, support them, help them in any kind of way that God will show you that they need. And I promise you, you cast your bread on the waters, it's coming back to you. What you send out is coming back. And until I see you again, and remember, we're going to be in service on the third Sunday, on the 21st. So please plan to be there as well. But stay safe in all this weather and everything that's going on. But stay safe, stay blessed, and may the Lord God bless you real, real good. Amen.